Warren Merziak. I'm a technical evangelist with Atlassian, and I've got 50 minutes to talk to you today about Atlassian Open DevOps. So we're going to get started and move pretty quickly through this. At a high level, we've got kind of four things that we want to cover. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is deploying to multiple environments using Jira and Bitbucket. This will be a brief overview of kind of the CICD tools that we have. Uh, the next thing we're going to take a look at are feature flags and how we can use those to control code execution. Then we're going to take a quick look at scanning security vulnerabilities with Sneak uh, that integrates directly with Bitbucket. And then finally, we're going to talk about how all of this ties back into Jira. So Atlassian Open DevOps, kind of at its core, is this idea that there is no kind of single tech stack that is sufficient for all customers. Um, we recognize that customers have different needs and already have existing tools that they use, and they probably don't want to switch off of their existing tools to new tools um, that do the same thing. So what we want to do instead is provide um, the ability to integrate a vast array of tools into Atlassian Open DevOps and have Jira kind of be the center of that that ties everything together. So with Atlassian Open DevOps, um, we kind of have this idea of a cycle of work where a team will plan out their work using tools like uh, Jira, Trello, Confluence, et cetera, and build a list of Jira issues that they're going to tackle for a sprint or a longer chunk of work, depending on how you organize your work. And then once they've got kind of their pile of work set up that they're going to do, the team is going to, individual developers in the team are going to grab those Jira issues and they're going to start working on them. And they can be a vast array of tools they use for this. You can do something as simple as Vim or Git, or you can do IntelliJ, Visual Studio, um, et cetera. There's lots of tools out there. Um, and we don't prescribe any set of tools that you have to use to build your software and test it. Once you've got your code built, you're going to push it up to some kind of source control repository that's going to run your CI CD. Um, typically, this is going to be something like Bitbucket, GitHub, or GitLab. Um, you can use other things. It's up to you. We don't prescribe which tools you have to use. We also don't prescribe which CI CD tools you have to use. That's, again, up to you. One of the things that we find really useful um, is feature flagging. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. But feature flagging is kind of this broader category of steps in your CICD pipeline. Um, you can use feature flags as part of your deployment technology stack, but there's lots of stuff you could do, code linting, um, security scanning, et cetera. What you do in your CICD pipelines is completely up to you. Kind of the pipeline you build is also completely up to you. So with that said, let's move on. So the first section here, we're going to talk about kind of just deploying code using Jira and Bitbucket. And I'm going to describe just a basic um, development workflow. So with any new kind of chunk of work that somebody's going to take on, um, typically we prescribe that you're going to start by creating a Jira issue for it. We need the Jira issue to tie everything together. So somebody's going to go into Jira and create this issue. It might not be the person doing the work, or it might be the person doing the work. It really depends. But generally, we want to track all work in a Jira issue. And the important thing here is the Jira issue ID. In this case, it's IM202. We can see that in the screenshot. So once you have a Jira issue ID, you can go into your tools that you use to build your code or build your product and start working. And you're going to tag all of your branches and your commits with that IM202. And by doing that, kind of the Jira integrations can tie everything together and pull that information back into the Jira. Um, so if we look on the right-hand side of this Jira, there's a development chunk here. Um, that doesn't have anything populated in it right now because this is a new Jira. But later, we're going to see that while we do our work, um, this starts to get populated with updates kind of automatically. So at this point, we've got a Jira issue ID. We've gone and we've built a bunch of changes with our development tools, and we've pushed to our feature branch. Once we push to a feature branch, um, Jira is automatically going, or sorry, Bitbucket's automatically going to start um, running a pipeline. And the pipeline is de or defined in a Bitbucket pipeline.yaml file in this case. Now, if you're using GitHub, it'd be in GitHub Actions, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, Whatever you do to define your CSD pipelines, we can take a look and we can see that our pipeline um, in this case has a bunch of steps and it's running. Uh, in this case, it's completed. The steps you have in your pipeline are completely up to you. Um, we have a steps here for running unit tests, running our sneak into tests, um, deploying to US West 1 and deploying to US East 2, and then integration testing in both of those regions. So for our pipeline, um, this is a dev pipeline for our small project here. Um, if the unit tests fail, the deployment stops, we don't continue on. Sneak tests fail, the deployment stops, we don't continue on. 
Um, if the deploy fails, again, it stops. And if integration tests in a particular region fail, again, the pipeline stops and we'll be able to dig into and figure out what the problem is. Once you've made changes and deployed through your pipeline, um, you can do manual testing in your testing QA regions. And then you can decide at some point that you're ready to move on and deploy to production. So to do that, we're gonna create a pull request. And in this case, we see we're pulling the changes that are in IM202 into mainline. Mainline is our production branch. Once you've got your pull request, it's gonna get sent out for um, approvals. So somebody's gonna do a code review on that, make sure that the code changes are up to spec, that there's no glaring problems with them. They're probably gonna go look at the pipeline that ran in Dev and QA to make sure that the tests all passed and to view kind of your sneak security scanning or your other steps. Maybe you've got code linters in there to make sure your code is up to spec. Once you've gotten your code uh, reviewed and approved, somebody's gonna merge the pull request in the mainline, and that's going to kick off kind of your production deployment pipeline. Again, this is defined by your Bitbucket pipelines.yaml file if you're in Bitbucket or like your GitHub actions if you're using GitHub. Now, one of the things we should note here is that our pipeline looks very different from the dev pipeline. Um, in this case, we simply deploy to three production regions and run integration tests in three production regions. The shape of these pipelines is completely up to you. Um, there is no prescription about what steps are required. So there are many, many, many possible configurations you can set up. Um, you can also integrate many tools in here. So if you want to do code linting or many different kinds of testing, if you want to do canary testing, et cetera, that's all possible. Um, it's really kind of whatever you can come up with. And the reason we do that is because we, again, recognize that not every company um, has the same structure, the same customers, the same uh, regulatory compliance requirements, et cetera. So instead of kind of trying to prescribe how things work, we're just leaving it wide open so that you can actually build the solution you need um, for your business. When this pipeline is done, you'd basically be through our three production regions and you'd have passed integration tests in all regions. Meaning as far as we know, based on the tests that we've written, um, the code is working correctly after deployment. So, and this is all automatic, which is really nice. Um, the developer didn't have to go in here and do a whole lot of stuff. They basically changed, made their code changes, committed and pushed. And then uh, once the dev pipeline was finished, they went into and um, created a pull request. The pipelines for production deployment run automatically. The developer didn't have to spend a lot of time mucking around and doing extra clicking to monitor this. They can go in and take a look whenever they want. So with that out of the way, we're gonna move on to our next section where we're gonna talk about some feature flags. Feature flags are really nice because uh, they allow you to decouple kind of the enablement of new, func new code um, from the deployment of new code. Some CICD pipelines can take days or weeks to get through. Like if your pipeline has say 30 production regions and each of those regions um, requires say soaking for a day before moving on to the next region, just to you know look for errors or to see if you're having increased ticket counts because you're monitoring activity in those regions. Um, there can be a lot of things that slow those regions or deployments down. With feature flags, um, we can decouple kind of the deployment of running code from the deployment of the actual code. Um, and this lets us basically uh, save a lot of time and have a better way of rolling back our changes if something breaks. We can also do canary deployments effectively with feature flags. So anyways, let's move on and take a look at this real quickly. So I'm using split for this demo, but basically if you're using feature flags, um, you're gonna go and set up a set of environments that mimic your deployment environments. So in this case, we're deploying to test, test staging and three production regions. So we create um, equivalent environments in our feature flag tool um, for this. Once you've got kind of your environment set up, the next step is gonna be to create a feature flag. And for each of the feature flags, um, you're gonna set up a default behavior and maybe an allow list. An allow list lets you um, enable the code for a specific subset of users, which is quite nice for um, doing your testing. And it's also nice for creating canary deployments where maybe you deploy the feature flag um, with an allow list set on for a subset of users and monitor how the code performs for that set of users. And then over time, you can flip that feature flag to on for all users. 
So in this case, we're seeing that we have a user, Atlassian demo user, um, and the allow list for that user is also set to off. So if we run this code, um, I've got some logging set up to dump some stuff to CloudWatch logs. We see that for some random user at Atlassian.com, uh, the feature flag is off. And also for Atlassian demo user um, at Atlassian.com, the feature flag is set off. So in this case, nobody gets this code. It doesn't run for anybody. So we've deployed to the region um, and the code is still not executing, which means we have equivalent performance and behavior to before the code is deployed, which may or may not be useful in your environment, but it is a thing that you can set up. Later, once we're ready to flip the code on for a specific subset of users, we can go into our allow list and we can toggle the behavior on. Um, and then we can rerun that code. And in this case, we look and we can see that split demo is off for some random user uh, and split demo is on for Atlassian demo user. So again, this lets us have our code execute different ways for different subsets of users, which is really nice for enabling test users to run our code, um, users that we control. It's also really nice for enabling a subset of your user base um, to use the new feature. Um, and this allows for canary deployments and stuff like that. So it's really, really handy. Um, now, the next thing is, why do we care about this? Like, what does this let us do? Why would we want to do feature flags in the first place? The simple first step is that it allows developers to go fast. Uh, essentially, I talked about having a long deployment pipeline for the code that um, had to do soaking and a whole bunch of other stuff in a bunch of different regions. Um, and it took potentially weeks. If we're not enabling the new code um, as we deploy through the pipeline and we decouple our deployment from our enablement, um, we can allow that pipeline to run a lot faster. We don't have to be quite as thorough about um, soaking and testing stuff. Instead, what we can do is we can lean on the feature flags ability to allow us to roll back our code very quickly um, to protect us from potential dangerous changes. We can basically deploy through our regions and then enable for a subset of users um, and test that way, as opposed to um, deploying and having it enabled for all users automatically. So we get some more fine-grained control over who executes our code. And this lets our developers go faster because they don't have to worry quite as much about the impact of changes. The other thing is um, rollbacks are a lot faster. So if you want to do a rollback in a traditional sense, you have to redeploy the previous artifacts that were deployed to an environment. Um, that can be expensive. If you've got multiple deployments that go in before a problem is detected, now you have to figure out which of those multiple deployments um, cause the problem and you have to redeploy maybe an old artifact. This can take a lot of time to figure out and just be a general nuisance. With rollbacks, we simply go and flip a feature flag to off and the code no longer executes. So it gives us a much faster way of responding to problems. Again, this is another thing that enables developers to go fast because resolution of problems is easier. They don't have to worry uh, quite as much about being perfect the first time. So next thing we're gonna talk about, a little bit about is security scanning. So security scanning, um, we have a deep integration with Sneak. Sneak actually has its own tab in Bitbucket and Sneak basically scans your repositories when it's enabled for known vulnerabilities against the database Sneak maintains. So this gives you kind of single click access to a CVE database inside of Bitbucket that's per repository. So instead of having to look at your repository's dependencies and go to an external CVE database and trying to figure out whether or not you've got problems or not, we can simply click into our Sneak um, tab in our Bitbucket and see all the vulnerabilities that are uh, present in this particular repository. So in this case, we can see that um, we have a vulnerability in X crypto for our Golang package. So we might wanna go and deal with this at some point or not. You can make that choice on your own, but at least now everybody's aware of all the vulnerabilities that are present um, in their code. So the final thing we're gonna talk about now is again, how this integrates back into Jira. So I mentioned earlier that this development tab on the right-hand side of our Jira issue would get updated automatically. So this is that same IM202 Jira. Um, after we've done some work on it, we've done some commits, we've made a branch or two, we've done a pull request and some builds. And if we take a look at this development tab and we drill into it a little deeper, 
we can see that there's stuff like branches, commits, pull requests, builds, feature flags, and deployments. So here we can see um, that we've done some deployments to testing, we've done some deployments to staging, and we've done some deployments to our production region. We can also see that deployments in production are behind our deployments to or test and staging by a little bit. And we can see when the last change was made. And if you click on these pipeline links on the left-hand side here, this will actually take you to the last pipeline that successfully deployed to that region. Um, so, or sorry, that deployed to this region at all. So that'll let you know kind of what steps were run, what code was deployed, and really help you with debugging if you start to experience problems in a particular environment. So after this deployment, say we start to notice that there's problems in US East one, we can jump in and we can see that, hey, IM202 went in uh, two hours ago, and this is the pipeline that I deployed it. It immediately shows you kind of what code changed and you can start to help um, diagnose your problems more quickly. Same thing with builds, pull requests, commits, branches, all of that stuff is automatically pulled in here. This means that the developer um, doesn't have to go in and update their JIRAs as they do their work. They can simply do their work. They can grab their JIRA issues, they can make their code changes, they can push to source control. The CICD kicks off and runs and does what it's supposed to do. Every so often the developer's gonna create a pull request to merge into production uh, mainline branch when they're ready to go. And all of that is captured into the JIRA automatically. This means that management doesn't have to ask the developer for updates. Instead, management can basically go into the JIRA issues and get an idea of what's going on. So if this JIRA issue was for a specific new feature that was being implemented, and the developer wanted to know what the status of that feature is, they could jump into this development tab, they could take a look at the deployments, the commits, the pull requests, all of that stuff, and really understand what was happening um, with that work without having to talk to the developer. So this allows the teams to kind of break up their work and work asynchronously. Developers can, again, stay heads down, they can build fast and they can go fast because they've got tooling support for the work they're doing and things kind of happen automatically for them. And development managers can keep an eye on what's going on without having to bother their developers. So finally, um, if you want more information on this stuff and actually get some details on how to do these things, we have a bunch of guides on support.atlassian.com. So feel free to dive into those. Um, some of the guides are really detailed and explain all the steps to set this up. So if you wanted to do multi-region deployment, there are guides for that. We've also got a set of webinars that cover this as well. And if you're at Team 22 with us, come check us out at the booth so we can talk about this in more detail. Thank you. Thank you.